Okay, this is the second session on the uh, COVID-19 uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, and in this session, we're going to cover uh, infection routes, protection from infection, and how uh, the virus is spread within the community. Now, before we start, it's probably good to have a little look at what the World Health Organization was saying about the pandemic back in March. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a new coronavirus introduced to humans for the first time. It is spread from person to person, mainly through the droplets produced when an infected person speaks, coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby. These droplets are too heavy to travel far in the air. They only travel approximately one metre and quickly settle on surfaces. This is the reason person-to-person -person spread is happening mainly between close contacts. The exact time that the virus can survive on surfaces is not yet known. So it is wise to clean surfaces regularly, particularly in the vicinity of people infected with COVID-19. Hands touch many surfaces, which can be contaminated with the virus. You should therefore avoid touching your eyes, nose or mouth, since contaminated hands can transfer the virus from the surface to yourself. When coughing or sneezing, cover your mouth and nose with the bend of your elbow or use a disposable tissue. If a tissue is used, discard it immediately into a closed bin. The most effective way to prevent the spread of the new coronavirus is to clean your hands frequently with an alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. This will eliminate the virus if it is on your hands. Stay healthy and prevent the spread of COVID-19. So that's clear. It appears that um, washing our hands is the right thing to do. What we're going to do is look at some of the evidence to find whether that is right or that is wrong. So the video that you've just seen was put out by the World Health Organization on the 28th of March along with this tweet, which clearly says that um, COVID-19 is not airborne. It's consistent with the video we've just seen that a particle that has been coughed out within one meter of someone can pass it on. You can pass it on by touching a contaminated surface but apart from that the disease is not airborne which might explain why early on in the pandemic um, our great leaders were saying wash your hands, face masks don't work. You probably all remembered that and you were probably thinking are they mad? Okay, so let's just look at uh, the three routes of infection and protection. And the main routes that we know that are out there are respiratory droplets, which are generally talked of as being large droplets of spit that are passed on by coughing, by sneezing, to some extent by speaking. And these are greater than 100 micrometers, so a tenth of a millimeter in diameter, and fall to the ground quickly. So you've got the two metre rule. If you're greater than two metres away from somebody, uh, you are safe. And we also refer to these as ballistic droplets. Since these are large droplets, they are mostly blocked by both surgical and cloth face masks and will also block you inhaling or having one of these ballistic droplets, droplets enter your nose or mouth. So from this point of view, uh, face masks will stop these respiratory droplets pretty effectively and, and face shields will prevent people either projecting or receiving ballistic droplets. Until very recently aerosols were classed as small droplets, typically less than 10 micrometers that are small enough to remain airborne for hours and inhaled. Now this is a concern because aerosols can hang around within a stuffy room and someone could have been in there coughing, you could then walk in, inhale those aerosols and become infected. So these are much more difficult to block. They are mostly blocked by N95 face masks, which we'll come onto those shortly, and but these particles are so small they might not be efficiently blocked by surgical or cloth face masks. So this is a concern, this is why there's a, a very much of an anti-mask brigade of face masks don't work because these particles can pass through a 
uh, cloth face mask. A third route of contamination is contaminated surfaces, which we call fomites, and they, we know that the virus can survive on metal and plastic days. They can also survive on your hands, so this is why washing your hands with hand sanitizer is recommended to stop this particular route. Now, the early evidence from WHO was that this is a major route, so the most important thing you can do, that video said, was wash your hands. That's what Boris said, wash your hands. But they also say respiratory droplets are a problem, so don't stand within one meter of somebody. They are conclusively saying that aerosols are not the cause of spread. We'll look into whether that is true shortly. So these figures just show the effect of different activities um, and how far respiratory particles uh, will spread. So the, here is uh, an infected person. This is somebody sneezing. And you can see there's a turbulent gas cloud sending lots of aerosols and lots of large droplets. And these can spread for many, many meters. So if somebody sneezes on one side of the bus, someone on the other side of the bus can receive those particles. Coughing, similar, maybe not quite as far. Um, you know, sneezes are really quite explosive. But you can get these, these large droplets which will fall to the ground within a few meters, but maybe there'll be some aerosols that remain in the air. Whereas somebody who is just breathing, the large droplets will fall to the ground pretty quickly, and there'll be a small amount of aerosols in the air. Now, one area that has not really been uh, talked about much is what happens to these larger droplets if they don't fall to the ground. What if they're in this uh, in this size range between 10 micrometers and 100 micrometers, where instead of falling to the ground, uh, they dehydrate, lose their water, and then that could allow a large droplet to effectively remain airborne. And this we know that this can happen. So we call these droplet nuclei which are what used to be large liquid droplets which have dehydrated and have now become aerosols. And these can float in the air. So these are a problem which are now being looked at uh, much more. Um, however, a problem with these, they're very small. This is where face masks and a lot of the misconceptions about face masks come in. Face masks might not be able to block these from going through and into your lungs, but what they can certainly do is prevent the respiratory droplets from getting out of your mouth or out of your nose into the atmosphere, into the into a room, which could then become aerosols. So the big problem with aerosols is they can hang around until the air in that room has been replaced by ventilation. Those aerosols can linger around for hours possibly even days. So a bit more detail on aerosols here. Uh, there's increasing evidence that aerosols are a cause of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this comes from pu public transport officers and particularly choirs. And this is where we, we have seen infections occurring over long distances in enclosed spaces with limited air movement. Um, because these aerosols are buoyant in air, they just float around. So as I said, you've got to replace the air to get rid of them. And what we found, particularly some case studies that we'll look at, where we've got an infected person singing in a room with 60 odd other people, is that somebody singing, in a, even in a large church hall, has resulted in the infection of the majority of the people that they were singing with, even though they'd not been within one meter of most of those people. So this is really conclusive proof that this virus can be passed on through the air in the form of aerosols. So we will be looking at some case studies that support this idea. So we've covered respiratory droplets, we've covered aerosols. Let's look at fomites now. So fomites are any surface, so this, this is looking at contaminated surfaces, uh, you, someone touches or sneezes on the surface, you touch it with your hand, and that can transmit the virus that way. Now, there is some evidence that fomites are a possible source of transmission. 
Uh, the evidence, the more evidence that's coming out is becoming weaker and weaker. We know that these are incredibly important for transmission of um, some viruses, particularly those that cause gastroenteritis, so uh, norovirus, uh, where you've got the oral fecal route, and we know this is also the case for you know, other, vi other uh, waterborne viruses. So the oral fecal route is a major route of transmission. However, this is a respiratory virus. And it's always been a bit of a strange thing that fomites have been so um, highly proposed as being the cause of spread when this is a respiratory virus. However, there is some evidence that there is some people infected by this route. Now, the virus, as we've heard, has got a simple phospholipid bilayer, so mild detergents will inactivate those virus particles. So a quick wipe down with soap or ethanol will effectively clean a surface. Even if that surface has still got viral RNA on there, the infectious particles are destroyed by detergents and alcohol. Okay, so we'll look at some of the uh, personal protective equipment that can be used to prevent uh, COVID spread. And obviously you've all seen the face masks that people are using, homemade face masks, cloth face masks, and it's widely acknowledged these are not as good as proper surgical face masks, um, but they offer some protection. Certainly they offer some protection to other people. How much they protect the wearer is unclear at this point. Now, the, the surgical face masks that you can uh, you can buy, you can obtain, you see people wearing them in hospital, are what we call fluid-resistant surgical masks. So they were designed to prevent surgeons from uh, working over an open wound and basically dropping contaminated liquid particles and nasal hairs and similar things into those wounds. So you've got something that is preventing things coming out of the mouth and nose getting into, a, into an open wound. So we know that they will do this. They will block um, respiratory particles. As the surgeon is talking, um, those respiratory particles are blocked by that mask. Similarly, the virus will be blocked by that mask. Yes, a little bit of uh, air will come out down the sides, but the vast majority are blocked by that mask. And we're blocking those ballistic uh, droplets there. So these offer some protection, certainly against ballistic droplets. We don't know how much protection they offer to aerosols. The N95 uh, masks, uh, known as N95s throughout much of the world. In the UK, we have the uh, FFP, so filtering face piece, and these can be FFP1, 2, or 3, with 3 being the highest level of protection. And N95 equivalent masks block out about 95% of all particles, even aerosols. So these are very, very good at protecting the wearer from a contaminated person. So you would wear these if you're dealing with a COVID-infected patient. You would wear these if you are just doing routine work. However, these have mostly got a valve in there to allow the ease of breathing, and these let out effectively dirty air from the wearer. So these protect the wearer, but they don't protect everybody else. So if you've got someone working in the hospital who's got COVID and is wearing one of these with a standard valve in there, they can still be contaminating other people. And a lot of the face masks you see for sale that have got valves to ease breathing are a very selfish type of face mask because they are not protecting anybody from that person if they've got COVID. And that's the whole point of wearing a face mask in the community is to protect other people. So don't wear one of these with a valve in it. It's, it's, I would class it as being unsociable. So wearing face masks in a community setting is it seems crazy, and it seemed crazy since about February, that it's still controversial and it's still a topic for discussion. Uh, what we do know is in clinical settings, they work. They're not 100% efficient at blocking either the transmission or re receiving uh, infectious particles, but they work. Um, now, part of the reason why some people think that they are a bit of a waste of time is if you imagine in a community, at the moment, the rate of COVID in the UK is about one in 500 uh, have currently got an infection. So in the last week, 
2,500 people would have tested positive if you randomly tested people. So you need all 500 people to wear a face mask to prevent one single person who might have it from passing it on. So the vast amount of face mask wearing is not preventing any passing on a disease because the vast majority of people haven't got it. So you need everyone to agree to wear a face mask, otherwise it's a little bit pointless. And this little illustration shows how effective the face mask can be. Here you've got an infected uh, person who could be asymptomatic. They're talking, they're coughing. Uh, okay, they're asymptomatic, they're talking. They're firing out ballistic droplets onto two healthy people. This person's wearing a face mask and that face mask will block those ballistic droplets whereas that person is going to get infected. If this person wears a face mask, the number of ballistic droplets is vastly reduced, and as a result, we also think that the amount of aerosols are vastly reduced as well, so that somebody, if you've got two people wearing a face mask, they're pretty safe. One person wearing a face mask who's infected, one person not, not so safe, but better than this situation. And this is why we, within the universities, we have a two metre spacing with face masks so that even if somebody is in a class with you at two metre spacing and they have got COVID and they don't realise it, somebody sat at the nearest desk should not become infected and would not be classed as a close contact. So that is why the levels of um, uh, protection that we are, have on campus, which is two metre spacing at desks, and wearing face masks in class. That is why we're doing that, because these two people, even if this person tests positive, this person is two meters away, will not be officially a close contact. Okay, so viruses are much smaller than five micrometers, which is the cutoff of a mask, uh, even a, an N95. Won't they just pass through the masks? Well, the answer is no. The viruses are emitted as liquid droplets which are much larger than the virus itself and many of these particles are 100 micrometers or more uh, some of them just you know 10 micrometers but the, the fact is even though a virus could easily pass through an N95 mask that is not how they are shed they are shed as respiratory particles uh, as respiratory droplets so what I'm going to show you is a video just illustrating this because this video uh, measures the number of respiratory droplets coming out of somebody's mouth as they shout into a darkened box illuminated by lasers so that you can see exactly how many particles are emitted with and without a simple cloth mask. Now I'm recording. Stay healthy. Great. Stay healthy. Great. Less loud. Stay healthy. Good. Are you recording? Yeah. Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. Nothing. So if you want to see the whole study, you follow this link here. It will take you to the journal. You can see the whole study, how it was done. And this is a really good illustration of respiratory droplets. Okay, so there's some very interesting graphics that are going around, sometimes on social media, sometimes uh, elsewhere, that show just how well some countries have managed this whole uh, pandemic. So you can see Korea, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, who've had relatively few cases, or if they did have a large number of cases, they then plateaued. Uh, you see China up there. Uh, you know, China did have a lot of cases, but it did plateau. But we've got a whole bunch of countries here which have done really quite appallingly compared to uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, you could put Vietnam in that list as well. And a simple way of separating these is that these 
have not got a history of wearing face masks. These countries have, because these countries were really quite rattled by the first SARS pandemic, and face masks are a fairly routine part of normal everyday life. Okay, on this plot, China is up at the top because uh, China is where the virus started. So they had a whole load of cases before they uh, could really do anything about that. Um, so they are up there. However, they have managed to be, uh, prevent subsequent waves of infection, unlike most uh, Western countries. There is another possible explanation for this, which you may not have heard about, but it's starting to uh, become more evident, is that early on in the pandemic, the virus that spread throughout China and subsequently spread to uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia, uh, was an early variant of the virus where the spike protein at amino acid 614, um, as we can see here, uh, has got a D. Now D, is the amino acid that um, well the D the the code D is the amino acid aspartic acid. So at amino acid number six hundred and fourteen, we have an aspartic acid in the spike protein. And as we heard in last week's session, we know that this is a very big protein. Now there is a mutant version of the virus that has emerged, and that's this version emerged in travellers from China who ended up moving to. Europe in probably December, January, and this mutation emerged where amino acid 614 is a G which stands for glycine. So a single nucleotide change has resulted in that aspartic acid to glycine change. And the simple, well not simple, but the, the effect of that is that this is far, far more infectious than this. So it's possible that these countries down here are dealing with this particular version of the virus, which is less infectious, and uh, most of Europe, America, South America, and now India, are dealing with this G614 version, which is much more infectious. So it may well be that these got a little bit lucky in that they were, in, you know, it's this version that affected them. We've yet to see any conclusive data that that is the cause, but it's an alternate explanation. And what we see is that, you know, from um, the initial, you know, this is a proportion of um, the two different forms of the virus over time. And you can see that the G614 version is the predominant version worldwide. Okay, so let's back on, go back onto face masks and see how efficient they are. And I mentioned earlier that for face masks to be efficient, Every, to be useful, everybody has to wear them. Well, not everybody, but as many people as possible. And this graph illustrates how useful they are. So on this axis, we've got the adherents, so the proportion of the public that wear the masks, up to 100% down to zero, and the efficacy of the mask, how much of the virus they block. Do they block 50%? Do they block 100%? And then if you plot those two points, so let's say we've got 80% of people wearing masks and they are 50% efficient, then that correlates to a plot point about there. And on this graph are shown some R values. I'm going to cover R in great detail in a moment, but R is the reproduction number. Basically, it tells you how many people one infected person infects. And uh, if an R is one, then the uh, pandemic doesn't really grow uh, because one infected person infects one other infected person and who infects one other infected person, but the numbers of infected people at any one time never really grows. Whereas if the R is two, one person infects two people and those two people result in a total of four people infected and then eight and then 16 and then 32, and then you get exponential growth, which is what we may well be seeing now. At the moment, we have an R value of about 1.4, um, which means that the epidemic is growing, just not as fast as it was in February or March. So it shows that if, we, and this is plotted for this particular virus, nobody wears any masks, um, then you're going to have an R value of about 3. If you can get 50% uh, of the people to wear a mask, and those masks are 100% efficient, 
you can pull the R value to below one. So if we can, you know, at the moment we can see you go around the supermarket, 90% of people are wearing masks. As long as those masks are 40% efficient, that will drag the R value down to one. So that's a really useful way of thinking about this. You can either have a very efficient mask or very strong adherence to a mask that's not as efficient and you can still control the pandemic. So here's a definition of the R0 that you'll see in the news, uh, or they just call it the R. And the R is for this particular virus around three in uncontrolled settings. Now this is not as infectious as some other viruses. I mean, Ebola has not got um, a particularly high R, but it is extremely lethal. Um, measles has got an R of maybe 12. And this is why measles spreads very, very quickly in uh, unvaccinated populations. So this is a really nice illustration of um, R, or the R0, which is of about three in uncontrolled um, SARS-CoV-2 and similar for SARS if it wasn't controlled properly. So here's one person. That one person infects three people. Those three people infect three people and those three people all infect three people. So you can do some very simple maths to go from one to three to nine to 27. And that can occur. Each of these transmission events may be three, four, five days apart. So you can go from one person to 27, um, 27 people in a couple of weeks quite easily. However, that's not how it necessarily spreads. And it spreads very variably in that some people are very infectious, some people are not. And that's partly dependent upon the type of infection that they get. Are they, have they got a very high viral load and therefore easily spread it? But equally, are they the sort of person who, shall we say, spreads it about a bit? So on this particular plot, here's a person passed it on to two different people. And then this person's passed it on to four who have all passed it on to three independent people. This person maybe here works in a bar whilst being symptomatic and passes it on to seven people. Whereas this person self-isolated because they knew they'd been in contact with somebody and passes it on to nobody. In both of these situations, the R is three. In this situation, everybody's spreading it around a bit. In this situation, some people are not spreading it other people are spreading it more than others. Now this article down here is a really good one to read because this explains uh, the concept of R uh, really nicely. Okay, so R is one new term that you need to be dealing with and understand. And there's another one called the dispersion parameter K, which you really won't have come across. And it's not really talked about much in the medium, media as a specific parameter, but it's a way of describing how unevenly people pass on the virus. And uh, what we know from uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is that in some situations, 80% of the transmission comes from just 10% of infected people. So think about that again. So we have 10 infected people. One of those is, pa is passing it on the other eight are effectively not passing it on. And uh, so we can draw some plots to illustrate that. So here's one person who's passed it on to 16 other people. One of those people have uh, has passed it on to one other person and that one other person has then passed it on to 11 other people. So you've still got an R of three in this situation. It's just that some people are spreading it around much more than others. And there are some clever graphs that show this dispersion parameter. I wouldn't worry too much about this, other, you know, other than a K of 10 basically means that infected people spread the disease equally. So this axis here is proportion of transmission due to the most infectious 20% of cases. So if the most infectious 20% of cases um, result in 20% of transmission, then everybody is spreading it at an equal rate. Whereas if, and that gives a dispersion parameter of 10, whereas if you've got a much smaller volume, uh, value down here, it means that 
the 20% most infectious people are disproportionately spreading a lot more of the virus. So we can end up with statements like this. 80% of transmission comes from just 10% of infected people. And that means that the, the K value for SARS-CoV-2 is, is somewhere down here. It basically means there is uneven spread. Some are spreading it, some are not. Some of the, those who are spreading it we can call super spreaders. So I'm going to take you through some case studies on super spreading events and what I want you to do is look up um, some of these case studies and have a look through them yourself. I'll just very briefly whiz through the key points of it. But the sort of things that can cause a super spreading event is a person who is not uh, wearing a face mask for example or you know coughing in a very busy place but the, the situation is important here. The sorts of places that are high risk are indoors with poor air circulation where there's lots of singing, exercising, speaking in close contact, giving lots of respiratory type droplets, a low temperature and high humidity, so in a, uh, a chilled food factory, and also cruise ships where you've got people really packed on top of each other, and air that seems to circulate from one cabin to the next, to the next, and to the next, that could drag uh, aerosols from one room to the next. We've also got the problem here of... Um, canteens where people are handling food and potentially passing it on by fomites. And this link here takes you to a database of super spreading events and lots of these are very very well characterised including the faecal spreading tower block um, case study which we will come on to. So this is one of the most famous um, clusters and there's a very early event which caused a huge amount of uh, spread in South Korea and this was uh, a dance workshop and aerobics workshop and the link to it is there but basically what happened is there were 27 instructors um, who had been working in close proximity eight subsequently turned out to be positive um, for the virus all eight were asymptomatic when they did their workshops uh, but by the 9th of March there were 112 cases that were linked directly back to attendance at that workshop and these little diagrams show how these transmissions are occurring. So this is instructor A doing various fitness classes and then within those fitness classes these are different students who have been shown to be infected by this person and then subsequently passed on to somebody else. So this person passed it on to this person on this date or let's say this person on this date and then that person passed it on to this person here and was this person was tested positive on the 29th. So all of these diagrams are illustrating passing on from the instructor to a person and then subsequent community spread. So instructor A alone instructed participants on eight separate aerobics or dance sessions. And uh, of all the people that were in those class, classes, 26% got infected. So we call that an attack rate of 26%. One particular aerobic session, probably with poor circulation and very vig vigorous activity, 66% of the people in that aerobics class subsequently tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. This is much higher than what we call the secondary and tertiary attack rate, which is of these people that got infected, some of them passed it on to other people, lots of them didn't. So it seems like this environment resulted in a very, very high attack rate, but even the home environment was a much lower attack rate. Uh, so there's disproportionate amounts of transmission going on in this um, setting. What's really interesting is throughout the course of this, uh, these exercise classes, Pilates sessions, which involve lots of, I wouldn't say laying around and not doing very much, but not, uh, you know, slow movements and not heavy breathing and no shouting, uh, no shouting of instructions. These sessions did not result in any infections, even though the infected people were taking those classes. Okay, so probably the next most famous um, episode is the uh, Washington Choir practice, and in 
this was a very early super trading event. 60 members meet on the 10th of March. So the numbers have been slightly cut off there. Um, but they meet on the 10th of March um, and on the 3rd of March. That's the 3rd, that's the 10th. This is where the index patient we think became positive turned up to the 10th of March and this is where uh, people then subsequently came down with symptoms, some the day after, some several days after. And it strongly suggests that this is a single super spreading event from this patient here. Of these, 65% of the people who attended that session in a church hall became unwell. Um, and so 87% of people, you know, so 65% of the people who, who went to this first session became ill, but most of them came to this session as well and 87% of people who were at this second session uh, developed COVID. Three died, uh, two died, three were hospitalised but this all suggests that one person singing in that quiet passed on disease to all of those people and set off a huge super spreading event. Okay there are lots more examples of super spreading events. Here's a restaurant in China. Uh, there's the link feel free to have a read about it. I'm not going to talk through all of these super spreading events. You've got the slides, but you've also got links to them. Um, I will briefly explain this one because you haven't got uh, a link to this one, but uh, this is spread of SARS, not SARS-CoV-2, but original SARS in 2004. There is the index patient, the person who got on whilst infected, and all of those uh, solid filled in um, squares and star type shapes were people who developed the infection subsequently presumably from this person. You can see people many many rows away became infected. We have very well characterized uh, super spreading events on a bus so here's the initial person who got on the bus infected and all of these people in orange uh, became COVID infected there's just one who got no symptoms. This person got on the bus half an hour after this person got off that we think was infected by this person. So that could be either uh, recirculated air on the bus or it could be a fomite transmission where that person has touched a handrail that this person touched and then licked the fingers or something similar. So there is some suggestion of fomite transmission. This one's probably the most disturbing route of spread and what we call fecal spreading and this is a problem in tower blocks where the uh, waste pipes are badly set up so what can happen is you have vertical waste pipes where everyone's uh, toilet waste goes into the same pipe and then there's air vents that can come back up and the shower waste and the bathtub waste also feeds into the same pipes now if the U-bends from the either floor drains or bathtubs or showers dry out, that dirty air can feed back up through the dry U-bend into the bathroom and infect uh, patients. So what we think has happened is someone down on the lower floor has got COVID. Or, uh, we know that the virus can be shared in fecal material. That goes down the waste pipe. Dirty air can filter back up through somebody's shower vent uh, or a U bend in a shower that's you know the shower's not been used much and that dirty air can come up and infect people on higher floors and what we know is if this is came up from where um, people on lower floors um, got COVID-19 and because of the numbering of the buildings it became immediately obvious that someone who lives in apartment 1502 becomes COVID infected, that's on the 15th floor, and then someone on 2502, 10 floors above, also becomes infected, and so does someone two floors above that. So what we saw, in uh, particularly in Hong Kong and areas of China, and this has been shown in other places, um, transmission up vertical soil waste pipes. So there's a nice link to the uh, case study there, if you click on that link. Now this is a really good paper that's just come out um, and you can click on this link here to see it. Um, and this is a uh, study that basically is a, a colour coded study telling you uh, what situations are risky, what situations are not risky, uh, you know, 
whether you're silent speaking or singing, whether it's poorly ventilated, well ventilated, and whether face coverings will potentially help you. So it's a really nice color coded uh, diagram to look at. So have a little think about this, about the places that you go to, are they well ventilated? Are there people singing and shouting? Um, are people wearing face masks whilst doing those activities? So have a look at that. And finally, um, all of this talk of aerosols and different routes has been finally acknowledged that serious mistakes have been made. So this is a video um, by one of the senior advisors to the uh, American government, one of the most senior clinicians in America. So just watch this video. On to transmission, no secret, a respiratory illness transmitted between people, usually in close contact. There was some real misunderstanding about respiratory droplets and so-called aerosolized particles. The aerosol and particle physicists that have uh, approached us now have told us that we really have gotten it wrong over many, many years and that particles greater than five micrometers still stay in the air much, much longer than we had thought. When we used to say empirically greater than five micrometers, it drops to the ground, five micrometers, it might be aerosolized. We know now that's just not the case. Bottom line is there's much more aerosol than we thought. Infected surfaces clearly occur. The degree to which they contribute to transmission is unclear. The virus is in multiple body fluids, again, what the role in transmission is unknown. And as we know, animals, both domesticated and zoo animals can be infected. And yet again, we do not know and doubt whether this is a major source of human infection. And that go video goes on for a little bit longer. So watch it all the way through. But it really just shows how little we knew when this pandemic first kicked off in the first wave and how much more we know now. Now, whether we're actually learning from what we now know is a different matter. Okay, so a bit of work for you to do. Um, have a look through some of these articles that I've hyperlinked here. Look at the original Blackboard uh, PowerPoint of the slides to click on the links and have a look through those articles. And what we'll discuss in the, in the next session is anything in those articles which is um, either difficult to understand or you want me to explain in more detail. Okay, thank you very much. I will see you next week.